Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone, and um, welcome to this webinar presented by uh, Triza Tech jointly with Rob Berg at Per Night. So I can see that uh, there are still a few people joining us. Um, so I'll just take a time to make a quick intro uh, so that people can uh, join us and uh, get ready for um, Rob's part. So, um, well, for people who don't know Rob, um, Rob is, uh, is a consulting insurance practice leader. So he mostly works with uh, major financial services organizations, helping them to improve the way um, their business works. So he will be leading the practical part of the webinar today, and he will be available at the end for uh, some questions. So his presentation should last about 25 minutes or so. And for those of you who want to stay with us for the Q&A, well, you're more than welcome to type in your questions during his presentation. So uh, you just click on the go to webinar widget, and go to the uh, questions area, type in your question, and Rob will be answering after his presentation. And for those of you who don't know me, this means probably most of you. I'm Jonathan, and I'm leading the communications and marketing department here at Triza Tech. Um, so I just want you to note that the webinar is based on some work made with the digital enterprise suite. And if you have any questions regarding the technology that is used or the tool itself, well, I just invite you to send me an email. Well, you can just reply to the follow-up email that I will send you uh, later on today or tomorrow. So um, who are we? Well, we're a solution provider at Triza Tech, and our software is called the Digital Enterprise Suite. It's a cloud-based software that helps business in their digital transformation efforts. Uh, it helps them at an era where the customer has more power than ever, you know, with all the uh, rapid advancing and enabling technologies uh, with fierce com competition, um, well, companies are facing some serious problems and we need to help them to be able to create and deploy rapid, um, faster than ever digital strategies. Um, so we, we cover the whole modeling spectrum um, from strategic planning uh, down to some very uh, structured operational models. Uh, so we help businesses not only to become more effective and efficient in the way that they do business, but also more agile in delivering and improving customer experience. So what you will see today is just one of many ways the software can help you improve how things get done in your organization, which is with process simulation. But as you see at the bottom of this slide, there's a bunch of components um, integrated in the suite, and all of them bring they bring value on their own, but they bring even more value when used together. So like I said, strategic planning, business architecture, capability modeling, uh, and of course, BPM, uh, are just some of the other use cases uh, that you can find with uh, the digital enterprise suite. So um, enough for me, and I'll uh, let uh, Rob start his presentation. So enjoy, and don't forget to send your questions. So uh, Rob, the audience is all yours. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, and thanks uh, everybody for for joining us uh, today. Um, as uh, Jonathan indicated, I'm with a consulting firm called Per and Knight. Uh, we serve the insurance industry exclusively, and what we're going to share with you today is a, a case study, uh, a, a kind of simplified version of the case that we did for a large insurer uh, in the state of Florida. So the uh, focus of, of today's uh, presentation will be around the Trisotech BPMN modeler, which is part of the digital enterprise suite, uh, and how we use simulation to support a large procurement, in fact, the largest ever procurement in the, uh, in the company's history. It was in upwards of $100 million was the, uh, the total value of the, the overall project. Um, we'll, we'll be taking just a slice of that for, for demonstration purposes today. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, BPMN stands for Business Process Model and Notation. It is increasingly uh, the most prevalent method of documenting workflows and processes. Uh, it's very, very easy to learn. It's more difficult to master, uh, 
but that's exactly the type of tool and the type of tool set that you want in an organization for process modeling because really anybody can uh, adopt it very quickly uh, and over over time with experience uh, certainly could master it and the, uh, the level of detail you can get to is 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 astonishing um, BPMN diagrams traverse the spectrum from what are called descriptive models which are just shared typically among management and leadership ranks to analytical models which is what we used uh, for this purpose all the way to executable models because the symbols used in BPMN, which will be familiar to, to most of you or all of you, uh, are semantically precise. An activity has a very specific meaning, a gateway has a very specific meaning, an endpoint has a very specific meaning. So they can literally be reduced to executable software code. And then simulation. Uh, why simulation? Because using simulation, you can uh, assess the impact of changes to processes uh, including staff additions or deletions, uh, the introduction of technology, the reordering of workflows in a software environment before actually going through the time and expense and risk, frankly, of, of making those changes in real life and waiting to see what happens. Um, in, in this particular case, we're using process simulation, however, with a focus on a cost-benefit analysis rather than actually optimizing a process. So we'll show you how that's done. Um, again, the, the subject of our, uh, of our study, our client, was citizens' property insurance. Uh, at the time, the third largest insurer of property in the United States with more than a, a million and a half policyholders, uh, personal lines policyholders, about 10,000 commercial lines policyholders. Um, huge exposure uh, in the state of Florida, which as uh, most of you probably know, is, is uh, highly catastrophe prone, uh, certainly in the news recently with, with Hurricane Irma. Um, citizens came together uh, as a result of the merger of uh, two main entities, the Florida Windstorm Association and the Florida Joint Underwriters Association. Uh, and uh, because they were developed as a result of a legislative decree, they were also compelled under statute to acquire the books of business of insolvent insurers in the state of Florida. Uh, so, as you can imagine, pulling together all of the technologies to service the policies and the claims and the billing, et cetera, associated with all those entities that were brought together uh, created a mess, you know, just to speak candidly. Uh, as a result, uh, especially during the 2004-2005 hurricane season where Florida saw four major hurricanes, um, the, the rate of customer complaints went through the roof. Uh, it was a very difficult period for them. And they were literally handing, handling their claims using a, uh, uh, an access database that, that somebody had clutched together. So you can imagine with that policyholder volume, um, the claims that came out of those hurricanes, and in fact, just to give you uh, a sense of scale, whereas their, their typical year, they would handle a few thousand claims, um, during the 2004 and 5 season, during one event, they had 300,000 claims. So it was a tremendous scaling up of, uh, of operation that was needed uh, quickly to accommodate that. And of course, the complaints uh, were many. Um, because again, they were formed by legislative decree and were the quote unquote insurer of last resort in the state of Florida, uh, which means every policyholder in the state of Florida, regardless of who your insurer is, pays a little surcharge on their policy uh, that goes to citizens to help fund them. Because if their insurance company goes out of business, again, citizens are statutorily compelled to, um, to pick up that business. Um, what that means is the public is very interested in the, the business of citizens, as are the politicians in the state of Florida. And as a result, we had an organization that was under intense political pressure and public scrutiny, especially by the, the press in the state of Florida. Um, just to give you an idea, um, an executive who had uh, sold a $900 million bond offering on behalf of citizens, and one of her uh, excursions was to London to meet with bankers to help fund that, that bond offering, stayed in a $400 a night hotel room in London. And that made the newspaper as an outrageous expenditure. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been to London, but I don't know where you can stay for $400 a night in the city. Um, but they were getting that type of scrutiny. 
So just this is really just to kind of give you the context uh, that we were working in and doing our analysis. So first and foremost, we had to find a whether there were commercially available systems available to replace their existing infrastructure, and and certainly at what cost. That was going to be very important. Um, and we had to convince the, the key decision makers, which were primarily a board of governors. The Citizens Board of Governors reported directly to the governor of the state of Florida. Uh, I think at the time there were nine governors, and they were experts from industry. There were people who owned their own insurance companies, their own agencies, had actuarial backgrounds. So they were extremely savvy, extremely intelligent and smart about the business of insurance. Um, so we needed, we need really to do our homework. Um, the other kind of aspect of this engagement that was unique is that all of our work product would be subject to Florida's Sunshine Laws, which are similar to the Freedom of Information Act at the federal level in the U.S. Um, so any person in the public, any person in the press could make a request and receive all of our work product that led to the conclusions that we, that we came up with. So again, a, an intense amount of pressure an intense amount of scrutiny around this uh, decision. And as I, as I said earlier, ultimately about $100 million was going to be spent. Uh, whereas every expenditure over $100,000 at Citizens had to be approved by the Board of Governors. So this was an extraordinary, um, extraordinary expense for them. So what did we do? We, of course, first wanted to model accurately the way things were done currently. We wanted to be able to diagnose uh, where the key problems were, and then based on the implementation of a new system or new systems, how things would be. Um, so after a fairly extensive vendor selection process, uh, we came up with a variety of systems um, in order to, to kind of solve this problem, and today's focus will be on just the claims management piece of that. Um, Importantly, we used real data. It was very, very key to make sure that we could obtain historical data to inform these models uh, so that we knew we were going to get as accurate as possible the results that we get out of our, our uh, simulations. And then, again, simulation was used to validate uh, any of the assumptions we were going to make about the, uh, the, the, the uh, efficacy of the implementation of the claim system by running the processes as is and to be in a software environment uh, prior to actually pulling the trigger and, and making this large expense. Okay, so a little aside here, uh, just for the benefit of some of you, a lot of you probably know this, um, but I wanna make a distinction here between process maps and process models. So here you see a very simplistic rendering of a claims process using BPMN. And here kind of to my earlier point, there are only a few symbols that are used here. You see uh, a start point, which is this, this circle with the thin line, an end point, it's the circle with the thick line. The activities are the rounded rectangles, the gateways or decision nodes are the diamond shapes, and the arrows, of course, indicate the, the, the flow of work through the process. Um, you can really render just about any process using just those symbols. So it's very easy to adopt by just about anybody in the organization. And of of course, extremely intuitive to read to understand what's going on when the when the model, I'm sorry, when the map is created correctly. So a process map, you're seeing what's being done and who's doing it and the sequence of activities. And of course, this is very useful when trying to diagnose things like excessive handoffs or excessive escalation or, or that type of thing. A model, on the other hand, uh, in addition to seeing what's being done and who's doing it, you can see what they cost and how long it takes, you know, how, what the duration is of each activity, and not just the duration, but kind of a, a prob you can model a probability distribution for the amount of time it takes for each activity and for the process as a whole and for um, transactions entering the process. Uh, you can model the uh, probability of exits from these gateways or decision nodes. Um, you can, of course, by running simulations, you can get output and capacity information, overall cost and duration information. By using facilities, like you'll see in the Trisotech um, uh, digital enterprise suite, that allow you to enter information 
for example, the who, what, when, where, and why of the process, time, cost, value information, any other descriptions. This is, this is beneficial not just for the purpose of, of simulation, but you're getting a very comprehensive set of process documentation all in one place, all, all cloud-based. Um, for specific activities, you can model the activity durations and you can break down the activity duration into multiple components, including in, in, in addition to processing time, transfer time, queue time, wait time, setup time, et cetera. So there's an awful lot of power in the model when you can model at this level of detail. And then finally, as I said, you can match probability distributions to the actual distribution of uh, uh, durations for the work that's being done for each activity. Okay. So what did we have to do? Well, we, we wanted to use simulation. We thought it was a good idea to support the procurement, effectively to support a cost-benefit analysis. Um, the, the kind of high-level criteria were that the organization wanted newer technology because they did not want it to be obsolete in a few years. This was a huge expenditure. They wanted it business rules driven so they could eliminate some manual processing and, and automate key activities. And again, for our purposes, I'm showing you a two and a half million dollar cost installed for the claims management solution. It was actually uh, considerably higher than that, um, but for our illustration purposes, I'm taking just a slice uh, of what we did. Uh, ultimately, I think we had two dozen different process models representing both uh, regular, normal, day-to-day -day operations and cat, uh, catastrophe operations, operations during a, a major hurricane, for example, which would be very different. So we had to kind of look at both worlds. Uh, since we don't have five hours today, uh, we're kind of keeping it simple to illustrate the point. Okay, so our evaluation objectives. We wanted to look at the current state and compare it with what we believe the future state would be given the advent of the new or the implementation of the new technology. We wanted to look for obvious process challenges like handoffs, rework, limitations in capacity that were causing bottlenecks. Importantly, we wanted to look at the expected financial impact of the improvements uh, as a result of implementing the technology uh, that was going to support our case. And our, our hypothesis was that taken together, we'd have the support we needed to gain approval from the Board of Governors. Uh, there were three sets of assumptions uh, associated with the uh, with the engagement. Uh, number one was claims were called into the customer service center every uh, approximately every 10 to 15 minutes during regular business hours. Again, this was based on real data. It's a very important point. Uh, we used regular business hours because at the time that's when Citizens was operating, um, five days a week, eight hours a day. Um, we assumed that claims would enter the process in, uh, on, uh, according to a normal distribution. Um, and then we looked at three months of activity. So that's kind of a, a snapshot of the setup. Um, during runtime, again, based on real data, based on proofs of concept, uh, based on historical information that we were able to get from the organization, um, we believed coverage verification would be reduced from five to 15 minutes on average to 30 seconds. Um, coverage verification, uh, for those of you who don't know, is just simply the process of um, validating that a claimant, somebody who calls into the customer service center, uh, is in fact covered for the loss that they're reporting. Previously, uh, that was a highly manual process that would require leaving the customer entry screen going into one of three different policy administration systems, entering the policy number, literally pulling up the policy in a PDF format and reviewing it to ensure that the coverage was in, intact uh, and that the, uh, the limits were, were appropriate and there was no prior claims history. So there's a lot of manual work that had to be done that with automation would be reduced to, to a, uh, 30 seconds or less. Um, similarly, adjuster assignment was a highly manual process. When a claim is called into an insurance company, somebody has to evaluate the damage or the loss. Um, so the customer service rep would previously manually look up a list of adjusters, look at where they were located, look at their uh, particular expertise, because if it was a kitchen fire, that's a different person than somebody who suffered wind damage, for example. So you want some 
someone with the requisite expertise, and of course they have to be available. But by using business rules, the roster of, and there were hundreds uh, ultimately of, uh, of adjusters input in the system, you could quickly kind of cogitate and, and it would return you a list of the three or four that were most appropriate given the location, the skill level, uh, the type of loss and the availability of the adjuster. Um, we said that there would be just a modest improvement in the overall time to adjust the claim from two to four hours uh, down to two to three hours just due to the integration of different systems. Um, and that's just total contact time. The actual adjustment could take weeks, uh, in fact. Um, and then the, the probably the most surprising part and where we got the most bang for the buck was matching checks with uh, matching checks that were issued to satisfy claims with all the supporting documentation, which previously was done by a room full of people who would run around to various printers pulling off documentation, finding the check that it, that it fit with, and, and uh, literally paper clipping them together and putting them in the customer file. Uh, instead, using the automated system, uh, using barcode technology, they would automatically be matched and come out in one package. So instead of five to 15 minutes per claim, um, it was reduced to a few seconds. And then finally, the benefits assumptions. In doing our, um, our simulation, we didn't assume we would realize 100% of the benefits or 100% of the, the gains that we would expect, uh, simply because uh, if, if the uh, simulation indicated you could do with, you know, 100 fewer people, chances are you're not going to lay off 100 people. Um, and there's leakage, you know, you're not all ever really going to realize 100% of what you think you will. So we discounted that to 75% of the expected benefits. And we also um, had agreement that any five-year positive return on investment would support the system replacement simply because there were unquantifiable uh, indirect benefits that would uh, certainly contribute to the, uh, the decision. Okay, so let's jump into, um, let's jump into the Trisotech Digital Enterprise Suite. Here you see BPMN Modeler. Uh, here's the rendering of our highly simplified uh, claims process. And you can see, as I kind of click through here, you can edit the data that's associated with each activity. So here's claim adjustment, for example. Um, you see I've just put processing time in here for, for uh, illustration purposes. And I've said that processing time uh, for this particular activity takes between 120 and 240 minutes, right, two to four hours. And most um, most claim adjust excuse me most claims are adjusted in about three hours according to the triangular distribution. And similarly, you can do the same thing for every activity. So this is where you're kind of doing the bulk of your modeling work. Um, with respect to resources, you can put in resource costs. So you might have an adjuster that costs forty dollars an hour and a customer service rep that costs twelve dollars an hour and just enter the, the data into your model. Uh, it's, it's really that easy, just going kind of activity by activity. The more historical data you have, the more accurate your model is going to be, and just enter it in until you've, you've kind of completed all the pieces here. Uh, likewise, the start point will show the rate at which claims were coming into the system. So here we have claims entering into the process being normally distributed with an average of about 12 and a half minutes between claims and a standard deviation of two. So, you know, put, I say six minutes on either side of that. So between six and a half and 18 and a half minutes, you would probably speak for 99 and a half percent of your claims. Okay. Um, another interesting uh, and, and uh, useful aspect of this, this uh, BPMN modeler is just the ability to validate the model. Uh, this is simple, so it's intuitive to look at and say that your start point is going to lead to an endpoint ultimately. But when you have more complex models, it's very useful to be able to click through and make sure that the model's behaving prop properly 
by just taking this token, which represents a claim going through the system, all the way through the process. And you would do it through each, each of the paths in the process just to make sure that it comes successfully to an endpoint, as we see here. So this is just another way of, of validating the claim. Okay. Um, so the simulation piece is really simple. Once your data are collected and, and populated in the model, you simply run simulate. It takes a minute or so to, to do its thinking. It's cogitating. <clears throat> Oops, sorry about that. That always happens during a demo, doesn't it? Let's try that again. Let's try this over here on our 2B model. There we go. Okay, so our data show up here on the bottom. Here, here's the uh, actual 2B version of the model where we've altered the, um, the model to uh, include automated coverage verification, automated dispatch, as we discussed earlier. So you can see that the you know coverage verification, instead of taking five to 15 minutes, you'll see now is just taking 30 seconds, for example. So all that new, all those new model parameters were entered into the 2B world, so we can do a, a comparison. Okay, your data kind of show up down here in a window, and also are available in either Excel format or you can pull up a, uh, an XML diagram. Uh, I'm sorry, an XML uh, file with, this, with the data. This is uh, useful if you're populating a business intelligence tool or a business process management suite. So a lot of ways to kind of slice and dice uh, the data. Okay, so jumping back in here, the results of our simulation showed a 26% increase in uh, claim handling capacity. Um, from 735 to 927 claims over three months. We saw cycle time reduction reduced by a third from 33 to 22 days. Uh, and we saw probably the most important metric for us was a 36% reduction in the anticipated average cost per claim uh, from 667 down to $430. Okay, why is that important? Well, you could certainly reduce headcount if you can do more with less, if you can get more capacity out of the same system, um, would translate, of course, into cost savings. Uh, the reduction in cycle time would certainly address the customer complaint issue. If it's taking you a third less time to get resolution on your claim, you're gonna be a happier customer. Um, the reduction in cost per claim translated to almost $900,000 a year in direct annual benefit in this, in this analysis. Uh, which was important for our, our ROI calculation, which yielded about 76% over the five-year period. So even taking into account our, um, our discount, we still showed a benefit of about $800,000 per year uh, in a five-year adjusted ROI of about 32%. And of course, we fully supported the uh, simulate, uh, fully supported the decision. Um, Kind of the summary, uh, we got creative. Uh, we are a relatively small consulting firm, about 130 people in five offices. Um, and we're competing about, against much larger, um, much more equipped uh, uh, adversaries, frankly, in the marketplace. Uh, whereas they took very conventional approaches to a cost benefit analysis with spreadsheet tools, which are very useful and very effective. Uh, we, we introduced the idea of simulating the process in order to support the, uh, the, the expected results. We dared to be different. Um, by being different, we got attention. So as a very small player, um, not among the ranks of the large uh, and powerful uh, consulting firms out there, uh, the thing that got attention uh, was the fact that we took a novel approach to, to solving the problem that they had, which was convincing the Board of Governors. Uh, we really got to know the stakeholders. Ultimately, there were more than 100 people involved, but we knew the profile of the Board of Governors members. We knew, of course, and interacted uh, very frequently with the executive leadership team, and we got their buy-in for the process. We got data from them, so we, had, we knew we had good data, um, and, and they were with us throughout the, the process. Uh, we used facts. 
uh, we we didn't really make assumptions on the input side. We had real data that we had documented in, in terms of pro, you know activity durations, costs for resources, um, and that type of thing. Uh, by by you know having access to that, uh, there was really no argument about what the assumptions were that we input into the model. And then finally, you know, once you have facts that are informing your model uh, that were that came from your stakeholders, the outputs become, you know, virtually unassailable. There's really no argument over the output. So, uh, and that's it. That's that's kind of how we applied uh, BPMN and um, business process simulation to kind of take a novel approach to solve a problem. Ultimately, there was um, unanimous approval for the um, for the project, as a postscript, uh, the project went went on uh, over, I guess, about three and a half year period after our analysis, uh, and was finished on time and on budget. So it was kind of a win win for for everybody. Um, and that kind of concludes my presentation. I just want to see if there are any questions that came from anybody, and I'd be happy to try to address them, or perhaps Jonathan could as well. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Rob. Um, so uh, I guess people are a bit shy. Uh, we don't have any questions for now. Um, okay, we have Will that raised his hand. Um, Will, I can give you, um, I can unmute you if you want to ask your question directly to um, to Rob. Will, are you with us? Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, what? So, how many? When you do the simulation, is there, do you do like a thousand cases, ten thousand, hundred thousand? What's kind of your default for for the simulation? Well, we, we okay. So we modeled a, an arrival rate for the claims over three months. So the the arrival rate um, was one claim every ten to fifteen minutes, normally distributed during normal business hours. And the results indicated what the output was. So it was about a thousand, roughly a thousand claims went through the system. A little more than a thousand claims went through the system uh, during the study period. Um, it was, yeah, there was no, um, uh, you know, we didn't have a set number of transactions. Rather, we, we modeled the arrival rate, and then the simulation kind of told us at the end how many got through the system. Okay, okay. that makes sense. Thanks. Sure. Okay, thank you very much, Will. So if anyone, um, you can do just, just like uh, Will did, just click on uh, the button to raise your hand. And we'll give you uh, access to Rob. Okay, so I'm guessing that you were very clear, Rob. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, everyone, for being there. And a uh, follow-up email uh, will be sent to all of you with a link to the recording. So if there are some parts that you missed, uh, then you can be able to go back and... Um, oh, there's a question here. Okay, <laughs> it's just a thank you to all of us. Perfect, so uh, we'll end the webinar like this. And like I'm saying, you'll receive uh, an email. So if you have any questions uh, for me or for Rob, uh, just don't hesitate to reply or I'll send also Rob's information so you can contact him directly. Thank you very much and thank you, Rob. Uh -huh. Thank you, Jonathan. And thanks everybody for participating today. All right, thank you, bye-bye.